Colin uh, Walls is uh, going to give us our text for the morning. Colin? <laughs> so starting in verse 22 it says this it says then the mob joined an attack against them and the chief magistrate stripped them off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods after they had inflicted many blows on them they threw them into jail ordering the jailer to keep them securely guarded receiving such an order he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet with stocks about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake, and the foundations of the jail were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer drew up his sword, wait, okay, so when the, the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison were open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself, since he thought that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, Don't hurt yourself, because all of us are still here. And the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke in the message of the Lord along with everyone in his house. He took them in the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, him and his whole family were baptized. Then he brought them into the house and set a meal before them. And they rejoiced because they believed God in his entire household. Thank you, Colin. I appreciate that very much. Good job. <laughs> I got this outline from uh, Clovis Chapel. Uh, he's a good Methodist preacher of the 19th century, early 19th century, early 20th century. And uh, I noticed after I'd been preaching a number of his sermons, uh, he's got two sermons called The Supreme Question. And they're different questions. <laughs> so how are they the supreme question? Well, I got to looking at that. You know, God came walking in the cool of the evening in the garden, and he said, Adam, where are you? Now that's an important question, where are you? But Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi in Matthew, the 16th chapter of the record says, and he asked his disciples, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now that's the supreme question from God. But in the Garden of Eden, Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And that's no small matter. And he raises quite an issue that is the second uh, rule of the moral law, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But the supreme question by man is asked in this passage, isn't it? What must I do to be saved? Now that's supreme. Here's a man amidst strange and perplexing happenings. And he's shaken by unfamiliar terrors, and he asks this question, and he's wise in asking it, isn't he? It's wise. And he's not the only one that ever asked this question. The Canaanite that walked in the fire and threw his child in the fire was really asking, what must I do to be saved? Sacrifice my child? Or the mother that walks to the Ganges and to the God of the Ganges, she offers her child and she walks away with an empty hand and an empty heart. She's trying to ask this question, what must I do to be saved? It's a dramatic moment in the life of this jailer. It's very significant. His whole life is going to turn. So let's look at this moment in the life of the jailer for a few minutes. <clears throat> two strange preachers have come to town and they've been talking something that's got the authorities all upset and so they have grabbed these men and torn their clothes off their back, tied them to a post and flogged them as a Roman soldier can do. 
And then they carried them to this cruel and callous jailer and they said, you take these men and put them in, uh, you know, I want them secured fast. And so he takes them into the darkest of the dungeon and throws them into a cell and I'm sure, a cell and I'm sure not so gently and makes them fast in the stocks and binds those chains around their feet and around their arms that are hung against the wall and clangs the door and the darkness settles on these two men just for coming to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. <laughs> but you know, they did not lose heart, did they? They didn't lose heart at all. They were praying. The first thing they did was they began to pray. James said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Prayer is important. Somebody asked C.S. Lewis one time, he, he was talking about, he was praying, and it was one of his agnostic uh, colleagues in the college there, and uh, he was kind of making fun of him, and he said, well, you reckon your God's going to hear you and, and change his mind? And he says, I don't pray to change God's mind. I pray to change me. Because you see, when we pray like they prayed in that cell, we become first of all conscious of God. That He's there. And that I'm praying to Him. And that I'm sharing with Him. And that I'm telling Him all that I have on my heart. And so prayer changes things. It warmed their heart. So much so that they were confident of God and so they began to sing. Now, isn't that wonderful? Wouldn't you like to have heard that? I wonder what it was. Was it Psalms 23 like we sometimes sing? Maybe it was Psalms 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth, and I shall boast on the Lord, and the humble shall hear and be glad. Or it could have been Psalms 37 that they sang, because just like these Russian singers that came to us, it was the Psalms that were the singing of the early church. Maybe it was this one, fret not thyself because of evildoers, for they shall be cut down like the grass. Sense of vengeance in that. But I rather think it more likely it was something like this, possibly Psalms 46. And this sounds more in keeping with the love of the loss that Paul had. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Though the earth be moved and though the mountains be cast into the sea, I will not fear. Now there in that prison walls, that's what they were singing or something like it. And you know, we talked about people hearing singing and God hearing singing. The angels heard, they opened the windows of heaven. And I'm sure it touched the heart of God. Not the sound, not whether they were on tune, not whether it sounded so great and it was a great chorus. It's because they sang from the heart. And that's the way our singing is supposed to be, isn't it? And so those prison walls that had heard groanings and bitter cursings, and these prisoners hear them, the record says. And this is strange. And they hear this and... God hears it, and you cannot mistake the irrepressible praise and joy in the heart of Paul and Silas, hearts of Paul and Silas. And you know, something happened. There's an earthquake on. God has listened, and he's taken in his hand this petty prison, and he's shaken it like a dicer shakes the dice box. And the jailer is thrown out of his complacency in his jail. His, his bed, and he wakes up, and the doors are open, and the fear and shame, not only of the terror of this earthquake, that the building might fall on me, but more importantly, now these prisoners have fled that are in my charge, and I know what's going to happen to me. I'll be dragged out and publicly executed for letting them go. And so he takes his sword and he begins to draw it from the scabbard. And from the dark of that uh, dungeon comes the sound of a tender voice. Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. 
Not just Paul and Silas, but not a prisoner had gone. We're all here, he said. It's that tenderness. And so when he hears that, there's another terror that grips him. Not the terror of the earthquake, not the terror of the Roman might, but the terror that in the face of these men that he has cast into prison, he's come face to face with eternity and things of eternity. And he's aware of it. And he's terrified by it. And so he goes and springs in to these men with a light. These men of the bleeding backs and tattered garments. And says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now don't miss that. He didn't ask. As we sometimes do. He didn't ask, what must I do to be decent? (laughs) Sometimes we think that's all it's about. I just got to be decent. He didn't ask, what must I do to be respectable? You know, be, you know, I, people out in the community okay me. They put a stamp on me and say, he's a good guy. Or we, more often than not, we ask this question, what must I do to be rich? Ask that early in life and then work toward it, spend all our time on it. Or, better yet, read all the magazines and what must I do to be beautiful and get the Botox and get the facelift and do all those? And I missed that mark. I got the wart on the nose now. You see, those are, they may be important for a time, certainly the first two, but they're not the most supreme question. The supreme question is, what must I do to be saved? And when you ask that intelligently, There are certain implications that are drawn from it, and we want to look at what's implied there. First of all, when you say, what must I do to be saved, you indicate that there are only two classes of people, saved and lost. Those that have life and those who are dead in sin. That's the only two classes. Now, we don't like that. That's not politically correct. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to talk about hell and people going there. And it's not pleasant. But you know, when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount and He came toward the end there, He said, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for narrow is the way that leads to life, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Jesus says there are only two classes of people. And when he came to the conclusion, he said, those that hear and those who don't hear, they're like this. They're like those who built their house upon the sand if they don't hear. And they're like those who built their house upon the rock if they do hear. There are only two classes of people. Are you saved or lost? Am I saved or lost? The most important question you'll ask yourself this morning. But these are the facts of the Bible. And the second thing it implies is that you need to be, he he was conscious of his lostness. He was aware of it. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He did not know. He was uncertain about how to get out of that darkness. But he was dead sure about this. I am a lost man. I am undone, as Isaiah would say. You know, if you're here this morning and you haven't put your trust in Jesus, you haven't committed your life to Him, you have no relationship with the eternal, and you're conscious of that, that's a great day. It's a great day when you stand in the house of God and you can say like that publican, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. When I'm aware that I'm lost. Nobody is saved that isn't aware of his lostness. And I think it implies this, that he believes he can be saved. You know, it's a sad thing about some people. They don't... uh, They don't believe. You know, I'm just so bad. I've done so many things that are just wrong. I don't know whether it's a false modesty or whether it's just ignorance of God's grace. 
But whatever it is, it's not the truth. It's not what is. What is true is, however sin-scarred, sin however guilty our stain makes us, whosoever will, he said in Revelation 22, let him come and take of the water of life freely. God's grace, amazing grace, it's here for us. And this man believed that he could be saved. Sirs, what must I do? And the next thing is, he was willing to be saved. You know, that's the thing about it. <clears throat> so many times, this man is no trifler. He's not asking for a theological debate. Now, you've got to get the sense of where this man is. Because he's not here to debate the issues between all the denominations. That's not his purpose. That isn't why he's asked the question. His question is, what must I do to be saved? And I know I can be saved, and that's what I want to do. He's willing to be saved. He knows that what Isaiah said in Isaiah 53 and 2, by His stripes we are healed. If you know that, if you're conscious of sin, and you know you can be saved, and you're willing to be saved, then here's the next thing that's implied. You must do something. Now some people think that salvation is simply a matter of, well, I'll just sit here and it'll fall on me. <laughs> you know, I'll go to sleep in the chair and salvation will be slipped in my pocket. And too many people live like when they're going to get in the casket and they're lying there, that God's going to drop salvation in their casket and their coffin. But it isn't like that. What must I do to be saved? I must do something. There has to be a response in the heart of this man. And he is willing. He is conscious of it. And he wants to do something. But he doesn't know what he must do. That's why he asked the question. And that's the implication of it. He's willing to listen. He wants to hear. And the answer is in the context of this passage. And these conditions, it implies, are not condition, are not uh, optional. What must I do to be saved? If you're going to be saved this morning, conscious of your sin, you're going to have to meet the conditions that God has laid out. Not what Protestantism says, not what the theologians say. Don't go read the books. Look at this man. Watch him. Watch him respond to the grace of God. What did he do? What must we do? Not optional. He must meet the conditions. Why do we say that? Simply because Hebrews 5, 8, and 9 says that. He became, Jesus became the author of eternal salvation. To whom? To everybody that just said, Lord, I believe. No, to all them that obey Him. There is something He must do. And the seventh and final implication of this is, it's an individual matter. The church is not going to take a vote on whether you get into the kingdom of God. The church is not going to decide whether you're saved or lost. It's not the church's job. It's not my job. I don't make that decision. It's not even God's decision. He said in Hebrews 2 verses 8 and 9 that Jesus tasted death for every man. He's done what He's supposed to do. He's sent a Savior. The cross is there. The conditions are out there. What will you do with your question, what must I do to be saved? And so, let's look just briefly now at what I must do when we look at this situation. <clears throat> you know, there's some people, and, and we, we're guilty of it, we're guilty of it. 
we, we do teach a works salvation so often. And it's not in what we teach about the answer to this question. It's when, when someone passes away, what do we say? Oh, he was a good man. Look at all the good that he did. Look at everything good. It doesn't matter. Isaiah said, all our righteousness are as filthy rags. I could be, Paul said, I could give my body to be burned. I could bestow all my goods on the poor. That won't save me. It won't save the Philippian jailer. It won't save you. It won't save me. We're not saved Paul said in Titus 3, verses 4 and 5, we're not saved by works of righteousness which, he, which we have done. So all the good is not what it is that's going to save us. That's not the doing that counts. Somebody says, well, <clears throat> you know, baptism is uh, just another work. Well, if you read Titus 3 and 5, you'll find that's not so. Take a look at it. He said, we are saved by His mercy and by His grace, not by works of righteousness. Now, put works of righteousness over there. That's all that do-good business. That's all that we claim for fame, and it doesn't count. But he says, but by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's our ultimate obedience to Christ. That's our ultimate acceptance of Him and commitment to Him. And that's what's taking place in the heart of the jailer. When Paul said, Sirs, when he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. That man was not a saved man at that moment. He had not heard the message. The next verse says that he heard and they preached unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them, the jailer took them, the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. Is this man a different man than the one that put them in the stocks? You can guarantee it. Has something taken place in the heart of this man? Yes, and you know what God calls it? He calls it repentance. And that's what he told those people on Pentecost. You need to repent and be baptized. And he must have told the same thing to this man. Paul did. Because when he washed them that same hour of the night, he was not willing to wait. He went and immediately was baptized, he and all of his. Why do that? Why do that? There are eight examples in the book of Acts, that are stories of people responding to the message of grace. And in every one of those, they hear this message. They are touched in their heart by the hearing, and that is repentance, and they want to do something, and they are baptized into Christ. Somebody says, well, why is that so? Because he said it. Galatians 3, 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. This man wanted to put on Christ. This man wanted salvation. This man wanted something to be united with Christ. How's he going to do that? He's going to tell the whole world when he is baptized. This Roman who's a pagan, who probably before this night believed in Zeus, maybe in Diana of the Ephesians. But this night, he believes in Jesus. And he believes that he, was die, that he died and was buried and that he rose again. And he says, I'm going to unite with him in baptism just the same way. And I'm going to tell the whole world, I believe in the resurrection. And that's what Paul says in Romans 6, 3, and 4. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into His death that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I've been somewhere. I'm going somewhere different. And this is the picture and this is what I want to tell and I want to unite my life with Christ and so I am buried with Him. And so Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into the one body. You see, this is the point at which he makes his full commitment. 
You can read, as Paul, as uh, uh, Lord pointed out to us a week, a couple of weeks ago, you can read all through the book of Acts, and you won't find a copy of the sinner's prayer. It's not there. You won't find a single saved person that is praying and was saved because of that prayer. You find Paul, a most miserable man, on the road to Damascus, and for three days he's crying and praying, but he's not a saved man until Ananias comes in and tells him what he must do. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. It's at that point. You see, we're look, it's a line of demarcation, isn't it? it I, I was going to draw it this way, right, and I don't want to do that. It's this way. The saved are there and the lost are over here. Why? How is that? Because he said in Colossians 1 about verse 8 and 9 that we are translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Where and when are these people translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light? It's when they come out of the world and into Christ. And for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put Him on. Doesn't all of that fit? Doesn't all of that fit? And that's exactly what that man did. Now watch it in the next verse. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his. He took them in his house. He set meat before them. And when he did, he rejoiced with all his house. You look at the Philippian jailer. You look at this Philippian jailer. You look at Lydia. When she was baptized, she said to Paul when he came into her house, if you have judged me faithful. Let's not get in a theological debate. Ask it like this man asked it. What must I do to be saved? All of the implications are there. I'm lost. I must do something. It's individual. D.L. Moody, great preacher of the 19th century, <clears throat> was in his cellar. It's dark. And his little girl's at the top of the ladder, so to speak, and uh, so she's looking for Daddy, and she can't see him. She's in the light, and he's in the dark, and she can't see him down there. And he says, I'm down here. Jump. I'll catch you. And instantly, she jumped. Now that's faith. You see, the word faith and belief is really best understood as trust. Trust in the Lord. Do what he's, what must I do? You must trust, he says. When you hear the message and you want to know where is the line of demarcation, what must I do? Do what so many countless others have done for thousands of years, for a thousand or more years. Be baptized into Christ. Arise and wash away thy sins. Not in the water. It's the blood of Christ. But that's where the grace of God meets your response. Won't you come as we stand and sing? <clears throat>